Welcome to MDC Connects 2021. I'm Sarah Brockbank. I'm a lead scientist at the Medicines Discovery Catapult, and I'm hosting the session today with my colleague Darren Holmes. This is a series of weekly webinars that we run over the next few weeks on Tuesdays at two o'clock. So MDC Connects last year was a series of informative webinars on drug discovery, but this year we're focusing in on complex medicines. And this is the medicines industry is in a period of change and we've got a shift towards stratified complex medicines, but these come with more challenging discovery and development needs. So in this series of webinars, we're going to explore the opportunities that these, uh, this new class of medicines brings, but also the challenges. And we're going to be guided through the steps to take an idea here from concept through to the clinic. And we're going to hear from those pioneers who are actually developing their own complex medicines, but we're also going to hear from the experts out and about in the community that are available to support them. So last week we had a really good introduction to complex medicines and this week we're getting down to medicine, getting down to the business um, with um, our lead molecule and how we select it and how we characterise it. And I'm joined by three speakers. Um, firstly, Tilly Bingham, um, who's VP of Science at Concept Life Sciences. And Tilly's going to talk about developing the assay cascade for complex medicines. So while the questions may be similar to traditional drug discovery, the answers can be very different. And then we're going to delve into the detail of some analytical methods um, with two talks from, firstly from Jamie H. Kosky, um, who's a postdoctoral scientist in advanced microscopy um, at the Medicines Discovery Catapult. Um, and Jamie's going to talk about how he uses advanced microscopy techniques um, to look at cellular internalization and trafficking of complex medicines. And this will be followed by, sorry, by Rebecca Thompson, who's um, Deputy Director of the Asprey Biostructure Laboratory. And Beck is going to talk about how she uses cryo-electron microscopy in the characterization and quality control of complex meds. We're going to take questions at the end of each of the talks. So if you wish to ask a question, could you please put this into the Q&A box at the bottom of your screens? And you can put this in there at any time while the speakers are in full flow. In fact, please do. So the questions are there and ready at the end of their talk. So over to you, Tilly. Okay, thanks, Sarah. Just pull up my presentation. Could you confirm, Sarah, you can see the slide? Yes. I can. Yeah, lovely. Thank you. So thanks for the introduction um, and, and thanks for the invitation to, to speak to you all today. Uh, so today I'm going to be talking about the challenges of developing an assay cascade for complex medicines. But before I delve into the detail of my talk, I'd just like to take one slide to introduce you to our company, Concept Life Sciences. Um, for those of you who haven't heard of us, we're the contract research services arm of Malvern Panalytical. So we're a people-centric organization working to solve complex human health challenges. And we have over 250 scientists across our specialist therapeutic areas of oncology, immunology, and neuroscience, and also our technical expertise areas of chemistry and analytical services. So we have over 25 years experience in the contract research services industry, and we are currently running a number of complex medicine programs um, across a range of, of different modalities. So you'll have been introduced at the opening seminar last week to the concept of a complex medicine and the, the definition for the purpose of this seminar series. And I'm sure you'll take in from that that it covers a broad and diverse range of different modalities. So from drug dendroma conjugates, antibody drug conjugates, ADCs, um, liposomes, uh, 
nano delivery systems um, through to advanced delivery mechanisms, uh, looking at uh, intratumoral and, and direct targeting. So I'm sure you can appreciate there's not going to be a one size fits all approach to a screening cascade for these complex medicines. But in fact, um, that's no different to the approach for a traditional medicine, where in fact each cascade is necessarily bespoke for the particular target product profile and therapeutic indication that's being developed, that the product's being developed for. And in fact, when we think about what we need to consider when designing and developing a screening cascade for complex medicine, the what, the, the questions that we need to ask are often uh, the same. And indeed the approach of beginning with a higher throughput in vitro assays and building to the more complex models is also the same. So for example, uh, asking early on questions such as, does the complex medicine demonstrate the expected mechanism of action in vitro? And can it be linked to a desired phenotypic effect? Then thinking about, is there an in vivo disease model which can link these in vitro mechanism of action observations to the effect that's seen in vivo? And here, in the same way as with traditional medicines, we need to think about species considerations and how that animal model might map onto a human uh, situation and whether we need to consider any um, translational bridging models uh, to build that understanding. We also need to think about can the effect in vivo be linked to exposure to our complex medicine and thus an understanding of the exposure efficacy relationship, the PKPD model that we need to build for the program. And finally, we also need to think about which translational human in vitro models are going to enable prediction from the in vivo and in vitro models to what we expect to happen in man in patients in the clinic. And there we're thinking both about efficacy and safety. So the questions and the what of what we need to consider may be very similar, but the how we answer those questions uh, can be very different um, and much more complicated to deliver. And that begins right at the beginning when we try to uh, ask the question of what is the complex medicine? And at the very beginning, how do we make and analyze it? For a small molecule API, there are very established ways to characterize that uh, product in the early stages with, for example, NMR and LCMS. But for a complex medicine, uh, we may be working on a much higher molecular weight scale. We may be talking about a polydispersed sample. Uh, we may be... Um, talking about things which have complex compositional uh, structures. And once we've solved the problem of analysis for the complex medicine itself, uh, when it's initially made, we also need to consider if that analysis is going to be uh, translatable to something we can use for in vivo studies when we're looking to assess exposure later down the cascade uh, to assess PKPD. And then as we progress through the cascade, we also uh, need to think about how do we assess and evaluate the developability of the complex medicine early on in this screening cascade process. So there are very well established developability rules for small molecule um, APIs. So things such as the well-known Lipinski guidelines, uh, or, or rules and the well-established biopharmaceutical classification system where things like solubility and permeability are measured and uh, assessed very early on in the screening process. And for uh, more complex medicines, we now need to start thinking about different developability criteria, things such as aggregation propensity and, and thermal stability. So the, the key message to, to get across, I guess, before we move into the rest of the talk is that when designing the screening cascade, we do need to answer the same questions, but um, 
we may need very different methods in order to um, uh, analyze our drug product, our complex medicine. We need more complex in vitro models and imaging requirements. And you're going to see uh, some examples of that later on from James and Rebecca. And we also need to start thinking about what will our developability concerns be for our drug product moving forwards. And they're likely to be very different from the things we would consider for small molecules. So I only have uh, 15 minutes um, to uh, discuss this topic with you today. So I thought the best way to do that um, was to take some examples of cascade assays and analytical methods from complex medicines um, that we've used in our laboratories by way of case study to show some of the uh, things that uh, are considered in programs uh, as we move forwards. So I've chosen three examples here. Uh, the first one is an antibody drug conjugate, ADC example. Uh, the second one is in the field of um, liposomes, LMP and, and nano delivery systems. And the third one um, is an example of an oncolytic virus. So this first example is an antibody uh, drug conjugate that's synthesized in our laboratories um, based on trastuzumab, uh, which is a um, HER2 positive uh, targeting antibody in, used in breast cancer. Um, and this instance, uh, we were doing a bioconjugation of a cytotoxic warhead based on monomethyl orostatin E um, with a citrulline valine linker. Um, and linking it to the uh, free cysteine residues on trastuzumab. So the, the first assay characterization that we uh, are looking to do on this product would be the same as for a traditional antibody, um, looking at things uh, like antigen binding, um, affinity and stoichiometry. Um, and for that, we uh, use a technique uh, such as ITC or, or SPR is also often used in this um, scenario. But because we have uh, modified the antibody and conducted a bioconjugation uh, process, we also have additional analytical con considerations for this complex medicine. And we need to understand something called the drug antibody ratio, so the DAR. Um, and for that, we need to use a technique such as um, gel permeation size exclusion chromatography, um, like with the Omnisec, to understand the compositional analysis of our complex medicine. Um, so understanding how many payloads have we successfully added to the um, antibody, so there are eight cysteines available for conjugation. Um, what's the population um, uh, heterogeneity of our product and what's the monomeric purity um, and what's the molecular weight. So those are our um, early characterization uh, techniques in our cascade, but as we uh, move through the program, we may want to uh, if, start thinking about developability uh, properties when comparing our uh, antibody uh, ADC candidates. Um, and moving to techniques such as dynamic light scattering and differential scanning calorimetry to start measuring uh, properties such as aggregation propensity, uh, thermally induced aggregation, and looking at the T onset and, and TM uh, to begin to understand the thermal stability profile of our different candidates. So the next um, example is also an example to sort of demonstrate the more complex analytical techniques that may be needed for complex medicines. And this is a very topical example, um, uh, a case study um, of uh, liposomes, LMPs and, and RNA delivery systems. Um, you uh, may or may not be aware that our company Malvin Panalytical uh, recently announced a collaboration with Luca Care. Um, looking at the stabilization and formulation development for COVID-19 vaccines. Um, I'm not able to talk about any data from, from those studies today, but um, we have an example on the left 
of a study on a um, liposome delivery system, where here we are uh, looking at the uh, zeta potential, so that's the, the charge on the liposome uh, surface as we change the composition of the lipids used in the uh, liposome. So what we have here is an increasing uh, content of DDAB, the cationic uh, lipid. And if you look, the increasing uh, concentration is, is along the x-axis. You can see that in the pink triangles, uh, it has a, a, a flat profile, so the increasing uh, lipid has no effect on the average diameter, so the size of the liposome. Um, but you can see with the um, blue squares uh, that we see an impact on the zeta potential, so the, the charge on the surface of the liposome. And that can have um, important properties for the complex medicine in terms of the impact on clearance, um, on its ability uh, to, uh, tissue, to target specific tissues, um, and also to, on its cellular internalization and, and dependence of that cellular internalization on size. So although um, these type of delivery systems have come very much to the fore recently with COVID, they have been around uh, for some time. Um, and indeed the uh, FDA, for example, have issued guidance for the industry on uh, properties that they should consider uh, during the development uh, of these complex medicines. For example, they um, outline 11 physicochemical attributes that we should consider, um, and they've identified several critical quality attributes, um, such as vesicle particle size, size distribution, and morphology. Um, and so on the uh, image on the, on the right, of, uh, the bottom right here, you can see a number of those different um, attributes that uh, can be considered during the design of your cascade. So understanding things like concentration, size distribution, and particle charge, uh, the excipient uh, and, and peg structure composition of, of, of the liposome, um, the bilayer phase transition, and things like lamellarity and alkyl chain order. And they can be measured with techniques like nano uh, particle tracking analysis, DLS, as I outlined in the, in the case study in the top left, um, GPC-SEC again, DSC and SACS and WAP. So um, my last example um, is, a, is a change of tack. And instead of looking at the analysis of the um, complex medicine itself, here we're talking about looking at a uh, more complex in vitro cellular models to build a human translational model for the um, drug product. So, as I said in my introduction, concept life sciences have expertise in that immunology, um, and we work uh, with a number of clients in cell and gene therapy to uh, design bespoke cascades uh, for that. And this is an example of a specific type of um, viral. Uh, therapy, uh, an oncolytic virus, uh, which is designed to be specific for certain types of um, tumor cells. Um, so it is both directly tumor killing and it also uh, instigates a response in the immune system to, to direct the immune system to also uh, attack the tumor. So I'm conscious of time, Sarah, so I won't go through the detail of all the uh, immune assays in this uh, screening cascade, but what, what I will just highlight um, on the next slide is um, our approach to assay one in this screening cascade. And here um, we're looking at determining the transduction efficiency or lytic potential um, in human uh, tumor cell lines in both a replication permissive and non-permissive uh, cell line. So remembering this oncolytic virus is designed to target specific uh, tumor cells. So here we use uh, a reporter uh, transgene, uh, green fluorescent protein, uh, which um, when the virus infects cells and effective transduction uh, takes place, we see uh, expression of GFP. And we have two different endpoints, possible endpoints you can use for this readout. So the, 
the top one is flow cytometry uh, readout. You can see in the non-infected cell lines, we have only 2% GFP expression there, whereas in the infected cells, we have uh, 96%. That's a, um, a, a single point in time. Flow cytometry is a, a destructive technique, so you get a, a snapshot view. Um, an alternative approach is in the images in the bottom and it shows the, the, the power of some of the imaging techniques that you're going to hear about from James and Rebecca that we can then watch this process over time. Um, and again, it's looking at a susceptible cell line and the um, expression of GFP and, and successful uh, transduction of, a, of our um, a viral vector uh, versus a, a, a non-susceptible uh, cell line. So in my brief 15 minutes, um, I hope I've uh, introduced you to some of the things you need to think about when designing a screening cascade for complex medicine. Um, I think uh, the questions that we need to answer are always going to be the same. We need to understand the predicted safety, um, the efficacy, and to think about testing the developability of, of our medicine as, as we build a, a cascade. Um, but although those questions are the same, then we are going to be pushed to need to use much more complex technical methods and experiments to deliver the, the answers. So that's going to be uh, uh, very different methods for drug product analysis um, that, that go into these studies, as well as more complex in vitro models and imaging requirements um, within the studies themselves. Um, and we also need to be mindful uh, that the developability and processing concerns are going to be very different, but there's a lot of guidance being issued by the regulators on the kinds of things we need to be thinking about there. So, um, on that note, thank you very much, Sarah, for the invitation today, and I'll hand back to you um, for, for questions. Okay, thanks very much, uh, Tilly. I've um, got a couple of questions coming in here. One around the design make test cycles. Ordinarily, we would just be working with chemists. Um, how does the complexity increase if you're having to work with um, scientists developing the warhead as well as the technology? in your assay cascade? So I think the, um, the design make test type cycle, I, in, in my limited experience, because it's not me working on a lot of these programs, I should uh, caveat that, you know, I, I work on a lot of the um, chemistry programs, because that's my background. Um, but it, it can be uh, slower in terms of the, uh, when you're mixing the chemistry uh, in with the uh, the products, so the cycle times can be slower. Yeah, I can imagine. <laughs> okay, I think that with um, time limiting on this today, we will move on to Jamie next. Thanks, Tim. Um, am I good to start? Yep. Okay. Well, uh, good, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining. Thanks for uh, letting me talk here. Uh, yeah, so I'm Jamie. I'm um, a postdoc um, at MDC, and I basically am using light microscopy techniques and analysis in order to answer some of the questions we get with complex medicine. So, um, I always found that microscopy is quite a powerful tool because it's quite diverse. And we are interested in basically complex medicine because it does open up the possibilities for this previously untargetable, untargetable druggable targets. And the, it gives an opportunity for us to basically more, be more specific when we're targeting cells and tissues and creating a greater therapeutic index basically just means we have a relatively greater safety. Uh, but there are a number of unique challenges that we have to overcome. So for instance, we have to have this medicine travel in the body and circulate through. So we have to have our cargo and our delivery technology stable enough to be able to make our way around the body in order to come into contact with the tissue. It then has to be able to accumulate in this tissue. 
I've seen here, and then hopefully has an, enough diffusional potential in order to actually penetrate further than just the first layer of cells it comes into contact with. Um, something quite nice about it as well is it actually can be quite self-specific. So if you have a receptor on your delivery technology, which is able to bind to something specific of the cell, you can actually target a specific cell. And then once it comes into contact with cell, the next issue we can come into is internalization. So it comes into contact, but then how does it get inside? How much of it gets inside? Yeah. There you go. So once it actually gets internalized, then we're interested in the actual cargo delivery. So what could happen is there are some forms and it could just degrade everything and you don't get any delivery of your cargo. Or hopefully what happens is the cargo does get delivered. Once we confirm that has occurred, then we want to look at the effect. So does this make the cell happy as it had the intended effect that you desired? Or something could happen, it could actually be toxic. And this could be actually because of the delivery technology itself, or it could just be whatever the cargo is that you're inputting into the cell. So in my cost group, we're kind of going to be looking at these sort of regions, so more the cell specificity and internalization and cargo delivery. Um, and when you're designing such a project, what you want to do is basically know what questions you want to answer, you want to basically find your analysis around that, and then you want to choose whatever tool you want. So at MDC, we have a, a number of microscopes. Um, this is what we're using to basically answer a number of questions in complex medicine. So we want to choose the right approach. And the approach here basically just depends on what scale you're looking at. So if you're just looking at tissue or organoids, you're going to be more in this this scale here, like one millimeter to 100 micrometers. Um, and as you get more down, you get higher resolution. In general, there's a trade off between the speed, the scale, and the resolution. Uh, so you can start off maybe looking at something like a high content screening. So you can do like whole slide imaging, like we have the um, Zeiss Axio scanner, or we also have um, access to the Opera Phoenix, which is more of a plate scanner. Or we can have a norm, use a normal microscope, which is, has wide field capabilities, as well as an apatome system, which basically just um, ups the resolution capabilities, so sacrifices a bit of the speed. And this is the type of region you're looking at here for such a bright field or white field setup. If you want to uh, look a little bit further or just have a slightly better resolution, you may want to move into something like the confocal. Um, Arcofocal, this is normal confocal. It also has a multi photon if you want to look a little bit deeper into things or to help the resolution be better, you can use the airy scanner. You want to look further that at a deep resolution, so looking past the cells and the organelles such as mitochondria or even bacteria, and you want to be looking deeper in like to the viruses, vesicles, and even possibly hitting some proteins. You may want to go something built for super resolution. So we have a storm resolution with perf and helo capabilities. If you're going to go further than that, you can have to go into a more electron microscopy, but that's uh, what Rebecca is going to touch on after this talk. Uh, so the first thing we want to know is what are your goals? You can have a whole array of goals. Uh, you can be looking to see what happens in cell binding, internalization, trafficking, real-time tracking, or you'd be looking at tissue and spheroid. And each one of them has its own method of analysis that you would use and then from that, you then decide basically what equipment would you want to use depending on its, its capabilities. So for cell binding, for instance, you can basically just have a hit and miss assay where you just go, look, is my particle interacting with this cell? In which case you might want to do more of a broad stroke and do like a plate or slide scanner. Or you could be interested again, is how is it binding on the receptor level? In which case you might be looking at a co-localization so I say where you're going, okay, this particle, is it localized with the receptor of my interest? In which case you're gonna need something with higher resolution. If you're interested in um, internalization, you might actually wanna look into something like 3D reconstruction, and therefore you can just reconstruct the whole cell and see how many particles are inside that cell. For that, you're gonna need a microscope with some Z-stat capabilities, basically taking uh, samples of each of the planes and then reconstructing it from that. Uh, for traffic, trafficking, 
So basically the internal mechanics of the internalization part of the cell and what happens after. You probably want to use something like co-localization again, basically different vesicles like the early to late endosome to lysosomes. Uh, for real time tracking, so this is when you're going to be using like live cells. Uh, you're going to need something probably with a higher speed acquisition if you're going to be doing tracking, but you also need your equipment to have something like an incubation chamber. So for instance, we have this built in our confocal so we can watch things in live. And if you want in something for tissue or spheroid, you're basically looking at something that has a greater depth penetration. So this could either mean you need to um, do sectioning you need to fix it and slice it apart so you can see deep inside, or you need to use something with a higher working distance. Uh, for, for instance, the multiphoton might be very useful in this regard. Uh, so I'm just going to talk through a few of the goals and see how we can basically design a project around it. So I'll start with uh, cell binding. So a cell binding essay is uh, quite simple. You can basically just determine whatever fresh threshold of fluorescence that you want on your negative controls. So you go through all your negative controls and go through and go, okay, this is the sort of threshold I'm looking at. And once you've done that, you can apply this threshold to the rest of your samples. So here we see in the positive control and negative control, the fluorescence that is over that threshold. You can then mark that within the cell mass ratio that we only are interested in this expression that is within the cell. And then we can just do a nice uh, cell region of interest with the overlap of the fluorescence. So this is just whatever fluorescence is over that threshold within the cell region. And we can use this to start extracting data, uh, such as the percentage area that's over that threshold, as well as any intensity values that you may be interested. Um, because of the nature of this sort of analysis, it's quite nice to start narrowing down your project. So if you're not sure of the times of the incubation or the concentrations you're going to use, even if you want to test different particles or different cell types, because this is more of a broad stroke, you can kind of start narrowing down your project to hit the areas that you're keenly interested in. So for instance, if you're looking like internalization, so here we have an example of a CD33 expressing cells in leukemia cells. And you'll see here that there is in seems to be more internalization at 60 minutes and then also 24 hours. While if you're looking at HER2 expressing cells in breast cancer cells, you actually only see some internalization after 24 hours. So uh, respectively, these cancers express these receptors. So these are very interesting targets for complex medicine that you want to do, but you want to also make sure that your delivery technology, as well as your cargo, for instance, in the HER2, in the breast cancer, you need to make sure it's stable enough to stay and react with the cells for a period of time long enough to actually be internalized. So this is how you have to start designing your product, basically. Um, from this, then you can start doing some quantification of the kinetics. So how, how long does it take here? So you can start off with, um, you're taking your image of your cells and then you can segregate it into parts. So you have your whole cell and you can go, but here's a membrane, here's a cytoplasm. I'm interested to see is there an accumulation of my cargo inside of the cytoplasm. So this is the accepted spot. So you can do this over a period of time, and then you can actually get this sort of spot space to see where it's efficient for you to start really honing in the analysis and how long would such a treatment take. The next stage you could do is basically doing trafficking. So once it's like inside the cell, you want to be basically looking at co-localization. Uh, for this, um, I'm kind of just using antibodies. I don't think it's, you don't need to necessarily isolate two antibodies. It's just this example. So you'd start doing like, okay, so we need to see that it's binding to the receptor and then internalization would occur. And then you start to get something like the early endosome. So then you can use co-staining something like with RAB5, which is the early endosome, to see when that's occurring. You can have it in the late endosome. And then if there's the recycling going on, maybe you want to stay in with RAB11, which is the recycling endosome. And then when the lysosome occurs and you get like the breakdown stuff, you could use something like RAB1. Then hopefully here, you'll get your release of your drug or your particle or cargo, and there'll be a, a happy effect. Uh, so what I'm going to go now is just go in a quick case study of what we have, have done in one of the examples here. So we're looking at basically the in vitro analysis of some silica particles. 
as done by N4 Pharma. So the aim of this is basically to evaluate the internalization of these particles in correlation with the, the desired effect. So the approach is we have uh, this positively charged silicon particle labeled red. And then the plas we have a, had a plasmid of DNA that encodes for green fluorescent protein. And because uh, the DNA is negatively charged, charge, it's electrostatically attracted to this particle. Um, we then incubated these cells, uh, sorry, these particles with the cells. And then we wanted to see uh, the efficiency of uptake of these cells as well as any subsequent GFP expression. And this was done using the star confocal microscope. So the setup is we have these cells, we basically can define the cell mass and use this to reconstruct the cells. We can have our particles and they're labeled red so we can reconstruct them as well. And then we want to define whether these are either inside or outside of the cell. So the issue, the reason we use 3D is because if you looked at 2D and you just look directly above, quite a lot of things might actually look internalized when they're not. So we want to visualize them in 3D and then we want to link these internalized particles to GFP expression. So some of the questions we may want to um, ask is basically how many particles are actually internalized? Um, when and how are they internalized? And was the cargo successful in re being released? And in this case, GFP protein being expressed. So we had um, a few time points, so 24 hours, 48, 72. Um, we took the images and then we reconstructed them. So if you look at this one here, you can see the GFP cells have been reconstructed and then the red arrow points towards where the particles are reconstructed within those cells. So taking the 72 hours as an example, this is going to quickly go through what you see. So you have your fluorescence, you can reconstruct the different parts. And then if we take the uh, GFP cells just as an example, you can zoom in and then you can determine where the particles are within this region. So isolating just to these particles here, basically determine how they are within the cell. So you have your cell board or your particle. If it's outside, it might be this color. If it's on the cell, it's more blue. And if it's inside, it'll be completely blue. And you can even go far, start to measuring the distance within the cell. So this is just basically just to show you some of the examples of how powerful microscope can be in just visualizing certain aspects of complex medicine. So I'm hoping in conclusion, that's what I've managed to show um, and that there's a, that microscope is applicable in just a wide variety of delivery technologies and targo, targos. Um, it's enabled to be deep and adaptable evaluation of just a wide varied amount of scales, different resolutions. So basically you can look at cells in either 2D, 3D, monoculture, co-culture, look at tissues, you can look at organs on a chip, you can look at them alive, you can look at them fixed, and you can answer just a huge array of questions. So like, what do these things actually bind to? Are they internalized? How are they trafficked? Do they actually get to the lysosome? Do they release their drug while they're in the lysosome? Uh, do they co-localize with anything in particular and look at their subcellular distribution? And just to end, this is a little video that kind of just shows how pretty my scope can be. Uh, so, yeah, thank you. Um, hope you enjoyed. Thanks, Jamie. Um, we've got time for just one question, um, and it's a practical one here. When offsetting speed for resolution, what does that mean in terms of test duration and or sample throughput per, per hour per day? And is it to do with the throughput itself um, or the, your capacity to data and analyze that? Um, I think it would be a little bit of both, if I've un understood the question. So you the it will take it could take longer depending on how many samples you're in. If you're adding one more sample, it can be an extra little bit of time or it can be days depending on how many samples you are wanting to add um, on the analysis basis once again it depends on how you are doing the analysis um, i 
personally tend to lean towards more of an automated pipeline. So once I'm happy and I've set my settings, I can set it running. And yeah, it may take a couple of hours. It may take even a day or two, but at least I don't actually physically have to be there. So in the long run, you save time because rather than going through and trying to do a smaller amount yourself individually, you can just keep have stuff running in the background while you go and do something hopefully more efficiently. Okay, thank you. Thanks so much. Right, we're going to crack on to Becky now, um, if you want to set it there, Becky. Uh, great, I'm just realising you can't see me yet, so I'm just going to start my video. And then hopefully you can see me and hear me. Um, great. So thank you very much to the Medicines Discovery Catapult team for inviting me to speak to you today. And a massive thank you to Tilly and Jamie for making my life much easier with their wonderful presentations. And I'm very jealous of, um, of Jamie's beautiful um, uh, fluorescence microscopy slide. So I'm here to talk to you from the grey world of cryo electron microscopy, but hopefully um, you'll be able to find it equally as exciting. Um, so hi, my name is Becky and I head up our biological research facilities um, at the University of Leeds, um, which for those of you who haven't visited the beautiful city of Leeds, um, this is us where the big black arrow is. So within the Faculty of Biological Sciences, we have a whole range of, of research facilities, but my first love and my um, other, my, I guess my main technique hat um, is, is, is around the use of cryo electron microscopy. And at the University of Leeds, we're, we're really fortunate to be very well kitted out in terms of technology. So we have um, two uh, Titan Krauss microscopes, as well as three additional transmission electron microscopes, which are really the best systems in the business if you're interested in studying um, the structure of, of, of proteins and protein complexes and other macromolecules. So um, uh, before I kind of delve into some examples relating to complex medicines, uh, just to make sure everyone on the call is on the same page today, just wanted to start off um, with a quick introduction to cryo-electron microscopy and what we mean by cryo-EM. Cryo so when we refer to cryo-EM, um, we're referring to uh, essentially a sample preparation technique, really, uh, where we take our uh, specimen of interest, whether that's a eukaryotic cell or, uh, or a liposome, an exosome through to a macromolecular complex, and we um, uh, essentially go through a process that we call plunge freezing of that specimen. So we form a very thin film, say 50 nanometers um, to 100 nanometers thickness containing our specimen of interest, and then we freeze that into liquid ethane, which is cooled by liquid nitrogen. This sample preparation um, technique has the ability to preserve um, the very, in terms of a, a fixation technique, it's essentially a physical fixation technique. We're taking our sample um, that's floating around in solution in, in its completely native state, and we're freezing it so quickly, essentially we preserve it in that moment in a layer of what we call vitreous ice or um, uh, ice crystal free ice. And this means that when it comes to imaging, for example, a macromolecule, we're preserving every position of uh, every amino acid position and um, every um, small molecule binding, every antibody binding um, on, on, onto that complex. So this is a really powerful sample preparation technique for us to be able to get our biological specimens into what is essentially quite a harsh environment inside our electron microscope where we're going to be imaging with high energy radiation, putting the, the specimens into a, vac into a vacuum. So um, I just so once we've prepared our samples, we put them into a, a transmission electron microscope for imaging. And these are the kinds of images that we typically get out. And I've chosen here an icosahedral virus to show you because that means they're nice and big and, and, and um, uh, obvious to look at. Um, but of, of course, we can look at everything, I guess, from 80 kilodalton sized complexes right the way um, through to um, complexes of many tens of megadaltons. And this is one of the key advantages with using cryo electron microscopy um, compared with other structure determination techniques in that it can deal with um, a very high molecular weight um, structures and as we'll get to later um, uh, polydispersed and heterogeneous specimens. So most of the complex medicines case studies I'm going to talk you through today um, uh, use a technique um, called single particle processing to turn these grey images that you see before you take that um, uh, essentially two-dimensional information uh, and turn that into a three-dimensional structure. Um, in the interest of time, I'm not going to um, uh, go through that in detail today, um, but essentially that involves us going through each, micro, each image or micrograph, 
picking out each of our individual particles and then feeding those into a, um, a computational algorithm that will then align each particle that is at the same orientation to give us a better signal to noise ratio um, image of, uh, of that specimen. So this is an example of some what we call 2D class averages of this data. And then all we need to do then is work out the angular orientation between each of these two dimensional images. And then we can use that to, to reconstitute finally a colorful, <laughs> obviously Vols color, um, uh, reconstruction of our um, macromolecule of interest. So again, in this case, this, this is an icosahedral virus. So essentially single part particle processing um, is, is an averaging technique. But the advantage is that we can use this, te this averaging technique to solve the structure of a wide range of different molecules. And one class of um, macromolecules macromolecule that um, we are quite commonly able to solve structures of um, is of target macromolecules with antibodies, fab fragments, nanobodies, or other um, uh, protein uh, binders um, bound onto that target. Um, and that can be a really powerful, uh, uh, so essentially um, we're able to solve a structure where we can get high resolution structural information of where our binder is sitting. So I just wanted to talk you through a couple of case studies there. So in this first case study, we have um, a bacterial um, outer membrane protein known as BAM. Um, and this is an essential, um, uh, it, it, oh, sorry, hopefully you can't see that flash thing. Sorry, I'm just gonna get rid of that. Um, so the BAM complex is an outer membrane protein. Um, it has two states um, and um, an organ, a, a company was able to identify um, a complex medicine, a bactericidal um, fab fragment. Um, which they found um, inhibited the complex um, and um, indeed killed the bacteria, um, but it wasn't known um, how, um, how the fab was, was achieving this. And so in this work, which was um, done in the laboratory of Neil Ranson at the University of Leeds, um, they were able to solve a high resolution structure of this membrane protein um, with fab, fab fragment bound. Um, and they were able to essentially show that the fab fragment was locking this membrane protein in a particular conformation, which therefore enabled the scientists to understand and rationalize the inhibitory effects that the fab was having. And of course, this beautiful structure was solved at such high resolution, it was possible to see uh, where, the, where the loops of the fab were interacting with the protein. So that was a really lovely example. Um, so I guess that's an example of, of, of a fab, of an antibody derivative. But the, the approach, um, the technique works just, it, just as effectively where you have an, an artificial um, or a de novo designed uh, protein binder. So a particular um, technology, again, which, which is used um, uh, in the lab of Darren Tomlinson at the University of Leeds, is these aphemers um, uh, protein scaffolds, uh, which is essentially antibody-like binding proteins. And this particular project, they were interested in, in finding binders to these to act as um, a, a method to identify plant pathogens in the field, uh, which was a really cool and novel project. Anyway, the structural side of this is that they were able to solve a high resolution structure um, of, this, um, of, of this virus uh, with the aphema bound. And again, understand in really, um, in really lots of detail um, the precise mechanism by which, um, uh, by which that aphema bound. So in the next case, the next, next case study I want to talk you, talk you through is a completely different class of complex medicine. So we're going to um, skip and talk about um, adeno-associated viruses, um, uh, which are commonly used as um, gene delivery vectors. Um, one of the key challenges in terms of developing um, these as, as, as gene delivery vectors is the fact that when they are manufactured, depending on the manufacturing technique, um, you can end up with um, a significant proportion of, of, of capsid vectors in your population, which do not in fact um, contain um, the, the target cargo. Um, and understanding this, um, optimizing those manufacturing processes is a really key part of um, uh, developing these AAV um, uh, vectors um, for use in, th in therapeutics. So, uh, we were interested in whether we could use cryo-electron microscopy to generate robust statistics um, on, um, uh, on whether AAV is empty or, or, or full. And um, indeed, what we can do, and they've shown some images on the right here, 
um, we can you can essentially solve a three-dimensional structure of your AAV virus capsid um, and you can see the yellow one on the left is clearly empty on the inside and the one on the right has got stuff in the middle um, even though um, to the outside the the organization of the capsid protein is you know down to the loop it's identical in terms of that structure of the outer capsid um, so we then went through a process of trying to say okay well what is the far what is the fastest that we're able to um, to do this full empty analysis and rather than going to the stage where we were solving final structures of the virus and um, we found that we could use, we could start stop essentially part way in our image processing pipeline and um, collect data on um, an AAV population um, and using a kind of an intermediate um, step in our in our processing pipeline we were able to show um, we could clearly identify empty versus full um, particles and quite rapidly get a um, uh, and, qu and quite rapidly get a full and empty ratio um, for a population. Um, and I'm going to touch on this a little bit more at the end, but we're currently working on how we can um, make this particular pipeline perform in a way uh, which is as um, automated and high throughput as possible. And the final example that I wanted to talk through with you today in terms of a case study for using crowd lateral microscopy in the characterization of a complex medicine um, is looking at liposome and exosome or um, uh, characterization. Of course, really actually this applies to, um, to, to, to any kind of membrane bound structures. Um, so many of these membrane bound structures have got um, great potential as, as drug delivery vehicles, um, as Tilly describes some beautiful examples in her work. Um, we have quite a large number of projects in this category coming through my facility at the university. Unfortunately, none of those results were ones that I could share with you today. Um, so I've, I've, I've lent on this beautiful publication from uh, that was published um, uh, just last year now, which shows uh, essentially just um, essentially images of exosomes that are just taken so there's no processing involved in this it's literally just taking taking a picture of the different of the different exosomes and this particular example was exosomes that had been extracted um, from a patient sample and then imaged and basically the, the aim of this was to show the heterogeneity in terms of these the, these exosome structures uh, and I guess what I'd like you to take away from this is that even just in a single image, it's really easy to see whether your whether your individual um, exosome or liposome is um, unilamella, if it's multilamella, um, if it is heavily packaged with cargo like G and HR, um, uh, and whether there are any interesting sort of membrane budding events and things going on. And this can be really complementary to some of the other ensemble measurements, which are commonly used, um, like dynamic light scattering, for example, um, in the in the context of um, of characterizing these populations. Um, of course, this gives you two dimensional um, information. And as Jamie loved, um, described um, in his cell example, where um, you have um, uh, you have your nanoparticles, or whatever, either outside or inside the cell, and saying, well, how can you validate that? Um, we can actually go one step further in terms of the characterization of these membranes and use a, an approach rather than single particle electron microscopy, which the previous two approaches um, used, use an alternative approach called cryo electron tomography. So in cryo electron tomography, rather than taking, um, uh, we essentially take images of our specimen, but we take multiple images at different um, angular orientations. So we, we tilt the sample, we move it around. Because we have an, because the the relationship between those images has a known angular relationship, we can then use those, reconstruct them um, to form a tomogram. Um, and that tomogram can then give us, she said I'm just gonna play, that tomogram can then show us um, information about, for example, protein binding in the membrane. So um, this is an example of something that was published just this week actually. Um, and this is actually my own, own uh, work. Um, showing a, a protein complex which is embedded into a membrane um, and actually in this particular case it's forming a pore but the approach could be used equally as successfully for um, for example an integral membrane protein um, obviously using this technique we were able to show that these particular liposomes were pretty empty um, but in the case of exosomes or if you're loading up a particular um, uh, uh, yeah, liposome system, you'd be able to see some beautiful three-dimensional information about the packaging happening there.
Okay, so she says, so those are the three case studies I wanted to talk you through. So hopefully you're going, hey, CryoEM is awesome, but you know, how am I gonna get into this? How long is it going to take me? Um, and I just wanted to highlight a couple of really exciting things that are happening in, in the field of electron microscopy at the moment. So the first thing is to say that, so these Titan Cross microscopes came to the University of Leeds in 2016. We're actually just going through our first major upgrade cycle since then with 1.6 million pounds of detector upgrades. These new detectors are not only more sensitive, so we should be able to um, collect a slightly higher quality of image, and I say slightly, but the real game changer with these cameras is actually the throughput. So we, we don't quite know yet, but we think that it's gonna be between three and five times as fast as old detectors. So um, the throughput of data coming out of these machines um, and our ability to collect data on multiple different specimens um, in essentially the same data acquisition run is, is dramatically improved. So what this basically means is that we can load 12 samples into the microscope, for example, 12 of your 12 different samples where you have a membrane protein with a different fab bound, for example, and we'll be able to set up an experiment where we're able to go and collect you 12 different data sets. Um, and then going back to Peter's question for Jamie, um, we are then hoping to be able to pair that with computational pipelines that will then automatically start to process that data as it's being collected. I think this is a really exciting development for the field. And I wanted to finish off and just show you a quick screenshot. This is hot off the press. So for any structural biologists in the audience, this is our, our so we, we, we literally had the, the cameras installed last week. So this is our first structure that's come off. And you, know, you can see the density for these beautiful aromatic um, uh, amino acids. You know, you, we, can, we can even see the difference between a phenylalanine and a tyrosine. So it's really beautiful. Um, and I think, I'll just briefly so yes, I, I, I think I'll, I'll just briefly mention this slide. So essentially what we're hoping to do is to take um, the kind of quality data, which I showed you in the previous slide, feed them into these computational pipelines and start to generate structures you know, within 30 minutes of data. So this means that if you're interested in doing what I would call not high throughput, but a more medium throughput um, uh, approach in terms of, for example, such solving protein antibody structures, then cryo electron microscopy may be a technique for you. Okay, so that's everything that I've got to say. Thank you very much for your attention. I'll be happy to take any questions. Okay, Becky. So um, with time sort of right at, up, at the limit here, so I'm going to give you one question. What do you think the future opportunities are for cryo EM in complex meds? Very quickly. I think re really the key thing for me is that increase in throughput. So whereas, you know, five years ago, it would have taken me days to do an to do collection and analysis of one target plus fab. We're now at a stage where, you know, we should be fairly comfortably saying, oh, well, we can do 24 for you in 24 hours, you know, an hour a sample and getting valuable um, information out. So that for me moves us from a very low throughput technique to a much more high throughput technique. So um, I think I'm going to be interested to see how far we can push that. So thank you. I am just going to thank all of our speakers for today's really interesting talks. We're moving on next week um, to understanding and optimizing our complex medicine. And we've got three talks. Um, one, Zara Ratre, Ratre from the University of Strathclyde, who'll be talking about the early assessment of prototype nanomedicine, nanobio interactions, followed by Jane Lawrence from the University of Manchester, who's going to be talking about the interactions of colloidal gene delivery vehicles with model biomembranes. Oh, I've got my teeth in today. And finally, Robert Weller from LGC is going to take on the tricky challenge of determining drug levels and PK profiles for complex drugs. So I look forward to seeing you all next week, next Tuesday, and thank you to all of our speakers for today. Thanks. Bye.